good afternoon, uh, early afternoon or uh, morning, depending on where you are. Or I guess if you're in Asia, potentially uh, good late evening. Um, I guess a little bit different from some of the other talks that we've uh, had recently in this uh, the Friday set of Zoominars. Um, we're talking about a somewhat different kind of NMR modality. Um, however, you know, don't fear for everybody who enjoys solid state NMR and DNP. Uh, there's plenty of complexity involved here as well. Uh, since we're looking at zero and ultra low field NMR. Um, which again is you know this sort of unusual flavor. Um, in terms of the, and now it won't even let me change uh, slides. One second. Okay, so the 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 traditional origin story that was always told, uh, at least in the Pines Lab, uh, about how zero field NMR came to be was basically that, uh, that Dave Zacks uh, sometime in the 80s was uh, you know, doing relatively normal NMR research. Um, then one way or another managed to quench the NMR magnet that he was working on, went to Alex, let him know what happened. And Alex told him, well, apparently your project is now zero field NMR. Allegedly he then thought about it and then decided it was actually a sensible idea. And it's, it's unclear how true the actual story is, um, especially considering that some flavor of zero field NMR had been going on for many decades before that, but at least it's a fun version of the story. Um, before I get into too much, and again, considering that uh, it's possible that questions may go a little bit long, I'm gonna start out by acknowledging the people who have actually been involved in doing this research. Um, you know, originally, of course, uh, you know, the team uh, in Berkeley was, of course, important. Alex, uh, postdoc uh, Michael Ledbetter, Jonathan King, Tobias Yolander. Uh, Danila Barsky is now uh, leading up some of those efforts in Berkeley these days. Um, and, of course, the ever-growing team in Mainz, uh, led by Professor Dr. Dimitri Budker, uh, who we actually also worked with at Berkeley. but. The timing worked out uh, that I also ended up working for him in Mainz. Um, we'll be talking about the particular work that we'll be talking about today. Um, a lot of work was done by uh, Dr. Tang Wu, who's actually now a professor in China, um, we'll, as well as uh, Inan Hu. We'll mention a little bit of the work done by Till Lentz. Um, you know, at the very end, maybe we'll have a little bit of time to talk about some of the work that Antoine Garçon's been doing, um, then also uh, James Ailes and Kirill Shibertstov. And of course, Roman is our uh, always trustworthy uh, panelist, as well as some work that's done with collaborators uh, from Novosibirsk, uh, Igor and Dundari. Um, and also, we have this uh, zero and ultra low field innovative training network that's funded by uh, you know, the Marie Curie Actions um, in a wide range of different universities throughout Europe um, and also in Novosibirsk and Berkeley as uh, partners for the group. Um, we're talking a little bit about some of the collaborative work that's going on. Um, in terms of the work that's being done here in Mainz, also with uh, Southampton. Um, and of course, there's other great collaborators, uh, including Simon Duckett's group, uh, Sami Yunnan's group uh, in Lyon. Uh, I, don't, I don't even go through everybody exactly, um, but it's, a, it's a beginning to become a growing and growing field, which is exciting for us. Um, in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, um, usually the first question when anybody zero field NMR is wait, what what the hell are you talking about? Followed by why on earth would you do that? And then wait, that's that can't be possible. How do you do it? Um, then we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how spin dynamics work in the absence of the strong magnetic field and how we actually go about making these measurements. And we'll end with some uh, discussion of applications. Some of them are uh, 
relatively normal. And of course, if you have uh, ever met me at a conference or seen some of the other talks, uh, there will be some weird ones. So don't worry. Okay, so probably everybody here uh, has some familiarity with normal NMR, um, unless you just manage to just wander into this uh, talk series. And just in case you are that person, I can point out that nuclear spins in general have the possibility of having a magnetic moment, provided they are not spin zero. So if they have some valence protons or neutrons, you're likely to have uh, you know, unpaired nuclei, uh, nucleons, um, which then give rise to a magnetic moment. If you put these magnetic moments into a magnetic field, there's a difference between being aligned with or against the field. And then if you take some molecule, in this case ethanol, if you then change the magnetic field while you have some frequency going on, you'll see different resonances corresponding to the tilting of these nuclear spins within that magnetic field, giving you rise to some sort of a transverse magnetization. So NMR is really a fantastically useful technique. It has this just unbelievably high chemical specificity. If you compare this to other kinds of spectroscopy, you know, you're, you're lucky if you can see a couple of different peaks, if you have some general blobs, um, or if you can at least separate that, okay, I know that I have some number of uh, you know, stretching modes versus uh, bending modes. And Amar has this advantage that it really can see individual peaks. And each one of these peaks, is, this in the case of high field NMR, corresponds to a specific part of a molecule. And it's, it's hard to find any other technique that can actually do that. They can also measure optically opaque samples. Um, obviously, if you're trying to use a laser to look at your specimen and you can't see into it, it's not gonna work. And of course, it's also non-invasive and non-destructive. Uh, this is, of course, especially important in medical applications where if you had, you know, invasive procedures are somewhat reasonable, destructive procedures are generally not very popular in terms of the case when your sample is actually a person. However, the weaknesses are also familiar to a lot of us. Um, the one hand, it's expensive. You have these huge cryogenic magnets, they cost a lot of money. Uh, you know, it's, it tends to be worth buying it. Obviously, companies keep on making money. Um, but again, it's inconvenient for certain applications. And also, of course, especially within the DNP community, we know that sensitivity in general is not what we would hope for. Um, you can find ways to make this better and better, but still, nuclear magnetic moments are small. The signals are, as well, also quite small. Then, of course, if you have anything that's conductive, you know, even again, people you get some challenges introduced, any sort of an ionic solution. If you have an actually conductive sample, it quickly becomes a layer of aluminum foil wrapped around your NMR tube, you're essentially not going to see anything. And also, of course, I forgot to click. Ah, damn it. So, again, so if we have metal conductors, we can't see inside of it. But then if we have heterogeneous samples, which if we're honest, most materials in the real world are relatively homogeneous. Um, only some fraction of them can become a totally homogeneous solution side of a cylindrical NMR tube. If you have heterogeneous samples, you have this bulk susceptibility effect that leads to broadening of your signals. So you lose all of this beautiful specificity of having nice narrow lines that correspond to specific parts of a molecule. So there are a few ways around some of these issues. On the one hand, you can just start going to lower and lower fields. Um, in particular, the work of uh, Professor Blumick and Aachen uh, using the NMR mouse to look at the kinds of samples that cannot go into an NMR magnet or inside an NMR tube, whether this is artwork or priceless violins. You have to find some way to do this and you can go to lower and lower fields and it's still possible to get some information. Then this is relaxation information, so you have different relaxation times and different materials. And if you can furthermore get spatial information about that, you actually have quite a lot of information. Um, also, uh, Lucy Davis, uh, Matt Augustine, 
I just happen to love this picture of Matt standing on a bunch of uh, metal barrels of, uh, I think it's tomato paste or just tomatoes. Again, using this sort of one-sided NMR to see if you can actually figure out whether or not these tomatoes are good or bad. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of possibilities, but you have to sacrifice something. You no longer have that spectral resolution. You can have resolution after you do this uh, transform based on looking at relaxation times, but you don't have that sort of le level of chemical specificity anymore. In many cases, it's worthwhile. Again, I don't know of many other techniques that can look at the particular layer structure of a Stradivarius, but if you wanted to know exactly what molecules are in there, it's not gonna necessarily tell you that. And so we can go even a step further. We can drop the field entirely, go to zero field, get rid of these big magnets. One advantage is that once you no longer have this big heavy magnet around, things become much more portable. You can imagine all kinds of tricorder systems. Again, especially you know, you look at the original series of Star Trek, you know, the size that they had for their portable medical devices was actually quite large. It's you know, probably reasonable. The other advantage is that we get rather long coherence times at zero magnetic field. So for a couple of reasons, one of them is that it is much easier to get to a homogeneous zero field than it is to get to a homogeneous 20 Tesla field. That's just sort of a simple thing, especially in terms of absolute field homogeneity. In relative field homogeneity, you start dividing by zero and things become messy. But in general, we can very frequently get you know, T2 star times that are several seconds long, which gives us really good resolution. Again, you can see through metal. There's a classic paper that I'll talk about a little bit later on uh, where people used, uh, in this case, just low field NMR to acquire an MRI image of a pepper inside of a Coke can, which cannot be done in high field instrumentation. And it's something that I'm particularly interested in, especially with some of the physics work that we've been doing, is we have a different symmetry at zero field than we do at high field. In high magnetic field, everything is based on the projection onto this strong Zeeman Hamiltonian. At zero field, we don't have that. So it kind of gives us the opportunity to look at spin couplings in their native environment. Um, a metaphor that I've always kind of liked is, you know, if you think about what high field NMR is doing, it's like measuring the height of a person in altitude on top of a mountain. Almost everything that you're measuring is how big is your magnet? What is that Larmor frequency in general? Um, again, you know, the range of, you know, a few to hundreds or in heavy atoms, you know, tens of thousands of PPM, we have the chemical shift. That's by comparison, the size of a person on top of a mountain. And if you're looking at spin-spin couplings, that's like looking at the altitude projection on top of this mountain. What's amazing is that it works. People have gotten so good at making these magnets, they've gotten so good at building the instrumentation that you can actually do all of that. But that is really, it just seems like a remarkably hard way to do it. In principle, you'd probably rather just take a microscope, take the thing you're interested in looking at and measure it directly. It allows you to see all of the specific structure. And it's not just a question of the projection of that hair thickness along the vertical direction. You're actually measuring it really just as, in this case, hair or, or practically spin-spin couplings. Um, historically, uh, some of the work that was done in Berkeley in the 80s was focused somewhat more on looking at the difference between uh, information that can be taken out with regard to anisotropy. In normal high field NMR, again, let's imagine that we're not spinning. Um, even if you are, you're still just at some level reconstructing pattern patterns. You have all these different possible orientations of molecules. And really what's happening is that that anisotropy is giving rise to broadening of your signal, which means that it becomes harder and harder to measure things. Um, so in principle, you can go and you can actually go and get a single crystal material, which is gonna give you narrower lines, a uh, little bit less information, but easier to resolve. However, if you go down to zero magnetic field, 
there's no longer this preferred access. And so it's no longer a question of your local principal access system projecting along the magnetic field. You're actually measuring just what's actually going on in that molecule. You're just measuring what's happening inside of that principal access system. And that can become really, really powerful. Um, again, you know, you look at sort of high field solid state spectra, of course, with fast spinning and other pulse tricks, there are other options, but taking the exact same powder material and going down to zero field, you can actually get information back out. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can do two dimensional spectra where one frequent or one axis is collected at high field, one is collected at zero field. Uh, there's a lot of nice stuff that can be done with quadrupoles. Um, again, if you try to fit this information, you're not going to have nearly as much information as where you actually have multiple resolve speaks. The one downside that they had is that they still needed magnets because at the time, the way that you had to do these measurements is you had to start by pre-polarizing your sample up in high field. In this case, it's marked as about four Tesla. Then you have to bring the sample out of the magnet down to a lower field, then suddenly drop to zero to initiate uh, spin evolution at, in the, under the zero field Hamiltonian for some amount of time. Then you suddenly bring the field back up effectively freezing, you know, reprojecting those spins back onto a more convenient basis, and then bringing it back up to high field for measurement. This meant that every single measurement became, had an extra dimension added onto it, which adds up pretty quickly. So this brings us to the question of why we even need magnets in the first place. On the one hand, you know, everybody really likes having chemical shift resolution. Uh, you know, even ignoring anything else, if you have a bunch of J-couplings and your chemical shifts are not much larger than that, the spectrum becomes complicated. Uh, things start to overlap and things can become very difficult to actually understand what's happening. You know, if you take a look at you know, the same sample at 60 megahertz versus 300 megahertz, things get a lot cleaner. Uh, the other favorite one is, of course, the question of equilibrium spin polarization. If you're looking at thermally polarized nuclear spins, you need to go to bigger fields because in, the, in any temperature that's really practically reachable for the situations, things are going linearly with the magnetic field strength. So if you're looking at a million times smaller field, you have a million times less signal just from the polarization. The other thing is that we tend to use inductive detection. It means we're looking at the time derivative of the magnetic flux through a coil. Because we have this derivative, you know, again, we know that spin precession is going to be, well, my pen is invisible, all right. Uh, we know that spins are going to be going around at the lower frequency. We're taking the derivative of that. That means that the sensitivity is also going to go, or the signal is going to go linearly with that frequency. There's some additional effects of increased resistive noise, but basically, and detection giving us both a factor of being linear in magnetic field. However, there are ways around actually all of those things. So chemical shift is really nice. Everybody loves it for high field and MR. It's what you get taught in organic chemistry, which may or may not mean that you love it. Um, but there's other options. It's not just chemical shift. Chemical shift is easy, but you can also look at high resolution spectra with spin-spin couplings. Our favorites are J couplings because we like to work with liquids. Of course, also dipole dipole couplings and uh, quadrupolar couplings. In general, at zero field, we cannot use equilibrium spin polarization. So we have to use non equilibrium spin polarization. But again, probably among the people who are uh, joining this particular seminar are familiar with the idea that even at high field, equilibrium spin polarization is nowhere near as good as it could be. And instead of inductive detection, we have to do something non-inductive. You know, we really cannot get away from the fact that that derivative is just terrible at very, very low frequencies. So we have to go higher. We have to. So if we can't go to higher frequencies, if we're going to work at low frequencies, we need to have a detector that is not based entirely on just this coil. 
Um, so, I, so before I go on, I can pause for a second to see if there's any questions to answer. Great, yes, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so first right. question from first question from the audience uh, is, in the case of zero field, what would be the form of the dipolar coupling? The present form of the dipolar cu coupling that we all know at high field assumes spins are polarized along the Zeeman field. So can you talk about that? It's the whole alphabet. There is no secular approximation anymore. Um, however, depending on your detection axis, the dynamics may uh, lead to certain transitions being visible or not visible. But in general, everything's there. All right, uh, we have another question, um, uh, which uh, is, uh, do you have any comments about how zero field NMR works for solutions versus solid samples? Um, it, it works in both cases. <laughs> um, of course, solid samples uh, were the main priority uh, in the 80s. Um, we've been focusing more on liquids since then. Um, uh, based somewhat on uh, the detectors that we're using, which I'll get into uh, actually on the next slide. <laughs> um, it's really it's a difference of frequencies and it's a difference of, co of uh, coherence times. So, you know, if you have a very short T1 as you're you know, getting down to zero field from whatever way it is that you're uh, polarizing your spins, you may have to do that faster if it's solid, but also solids uh, are often able to handle a little bit more stress. All right, great. Um, we have a question uh, about the detection methods. You said you're gonna be talking about that more on the next slide. So maybe we'll hold off sure. on that. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, well, but my uh, question is, can question? you comment well, more? The question is, can you comment more on the detection methods? Yes, I can. <laughs> so we can leave that for a minute. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, is zero field performed at room temperature or is there a temperature dependence associated with it? Uh, that depends on what you want. Uh, so samples have been measured at room temperature. Uh, Sometimes we measure at elevated temperature. Um, we've done temperature dependent studies, uh, some nice work with uh, some particular non-inductive detectors. Uh, they're called squids for superconducting quantum interference devices. Uh, those require that they require superconducting temperatures. So they work really nicely for samples at around four Kelvin. So really, everything works. Um, I'd say that the, the zero field NMR based on existing technologies can go between five or 600 Kelvin, but uh, probably we could get that up higher if we needed to. All right, great. Um, All right, shall I go on? <laughs> yeah, or, why don't, yes, why don't we proceed? All right. Okay, so as I was mentioning, so among these non-inductive detectors, uh, you know, there's a few possibilities. Um, you can have these superconducting quantum interference devices, um, and which are actually really beautiful, beautiful physics, beautiful technology. Um, however, it, a lot of things we want to look at, we don't want to have to go down to four Kelvin. Um, you know, the same way, you know, if, if we're if we're trying to avoid having to use that superconducting magnet in the first place, probably it's because we don't want to have a bunch of cryogenics around. Um, of course, there are a lot of really interesting applications where that's not the case, and if and people are still doing really nice work uh, with these superconducting devices. Um, what we've been using has primarily been um, these atomic or optical optically pumped atomic sensors. Um, which you can sort of see that I started to get towards here in that little picture. So what we do is basically we use atomic spins 
to measure magnetic fields. In this case, we're not measuring flux. And we're definitely not measuring the time derivative of flux. We're actually measuring the magnetic field at some place outside of the sample. So if you use, uh, for example, alkali atoms, um, where you have that one valence electron, um, our favorite one tends to be rubidium. It's a nice, uh, it's right in between there, uh, between uh, cesium and potassium, which have other advantages for certain applications. But basically the idea is that you end up having this one valence electron, if we ignore hyperfine couplings and all of that, and think of this as basically having a ground state where you have spin up or spin down and an excited state, which is spin up or spin down. If you apply circularly polarized light, you selectively drive atoms out of one of these states. So if it's you know, sigma plus light, then you are driving from the spin down state into the spin up state. And then if you're pumping hard enough, you end up building up more and more spins in that plus one half state. Then what you can do, and so, so basically we just have, we have one effectively big vector of uh, atomic spins pointing in one direction. And so if, if there's no magnetic field, they'll just stay there. If there's some magnetic field, they're gonna try to process, just like every other spin in magnetic field, they'll try to process. Of course, in this case, we'll, you know, in this particular mode, we would be continually pumping them back, but still you'll have some steady state angle that these spins will get to. And what's particularly nice is actually that if you then bring in a linearly polarized probe laser from another direction, or you know, ideally orthogonal, you find that actually that this leads to a birefringence uh, of that medium. So what happens is that depending on how far those rubidium spins have processed, you get a different level of birefringence for that linearly polarized probe beam which means that we have some rotation of that linear polarization. So basically we measure that rotation of the linear polarization of the light, and that directly gives us a readout of the magnetic field. Again, since we're talking, we're talking about trying to measure nuclear spin dynamics, generally that's the nuclear spins are gonna be moving at lower frequencies compared to what electrons would be doing. And of course, light is rather fast. So basically we get a, effectively a real-time measurement of what the nuclear spins are doing based on the magnetic fields that they are actually producing. And so in practice, what this ends up looking like is you have your sample, then you have a little box of alkali atoms. You have a couple of, you have a couple of lasers going in. One of them is to pump, the other one is to probe. Um, the way that we have it drawn here, we have a pre-polarizing magnet so it's not quite NMR without any magnets, um, but this is the permanent magnet to generate um, some degree of spin polarization. Then you can bring the sample down and use various coils to affect the spin dynamics as desired. And then you read it out directly. In general, these things end up being a relatively convenient size. Um, you know, the, the sort of, you know, important part of the system is here. Uh, it's largely obscured by the coil former, which was a uh, rather patriotic design originally. Um, and then again, you know, we have Ramon here, uh, in addition to being a, a panelist, he's also here for scale, um, showing what it actually looks like in terms of these labs. Uh, you know, really, it's a small scale device. It's tabletop. Um, you know, we have these relatively large laser boxes so that we can play around and do all kinds of atomic physics stuff. Um, but really, the, you know, the important part is just the magnetic shielding and the detector. And of course, Ganesh. Um, oh, this animation broke. That's too bad. <laughs> well, um, so before I was going to brag about the fact that you can do this um, without having to build your own atomic magnetometer. Um, you can actually go and just buy one that's already made for you. So for a long time, the limitation that people had is that, okay, great, you know, zero field NMR could be of interest, 
but if I don't have the expertise in atomic physics, if I don't know, if I don't have a laser lab set up, if I don't opti have optical tables, how am I going to do this? Um, now you can just go buy one. And so it's, you pay, I think it's, it's about uh, $10,000 for a nice little black box that you can put next to your spins and get that measurement down at really actually quite good level sensitivity. Um, this work involved uh, Tang Wu, uh, Inan Hu, and James Ailes. Um, there's other labels of what's going on, uh, unfortunately, behind the JMR cover. Um, but basically the idea is that really all you need is magnetic shielding, a sensor, and either a 3D printer or a, you know, a competent machine shop, um, along with some detection electronics and a way to put, apply pulses, and then you're basically done. Relatively straightforward these days. Okay, at least it disappears now. Um, so again, basically you have a magnet, you have, you have something that allows your sample to go from in the magnet down there. But really, you know, the, the actual effective part of the measurement is, you know, just a few centimeters across. And so the way that we actually do these measurements, um, you know, the, the most popular approach that we have is still uh, pre-polarizing spins. It is the most general technique that we have. It's brute force but it works. So what we end up doing is we start by pre-polarizing the sample in a magnet, which you know would be drawn up here. And then we drop it down inside of this magnetically shielded volume. Again, that magnetic field is generally kept to be much less than a nano Tesla. Um, in principle, we're sensitive down to the level of you know, a few femto Tesla, so we can test these sort of things. But then you bring the sample down, then you apply a magnetic field. So if we do it adiabatically, then we're still in an eigenstate, so we have to do something sudden to apply a pulse. Or if you actually just bring the magnetic field down and then suddenly drop it, you can again actually initiate spin evolution. And what basically happens is you can think about it in the case of, say, you have a single uh, proton and a single carbon-13. They effectively just end up beating against each other at the J-coupling frequency. You can think of this as transforming uh, you know, spin polarization from the proton to the carbon and back and forth. So it's rather than it being really a precession in space, of course, you can always draw it as a precession in some sort of mathematical space, but really it's more of a quantum beat back and forth. This is happening at the J coupling frequency, and you know, our sort of the favorite test molecule for this is formic acid, which is just uh, carbon 13 and a proton. Um, in terms of what's you know, really going on in terms of the spectrum, this is where you have to start thinking a little bit more quantum mechanically, a little bit more addition of angular momentum. So if I have two spins at zero field, get a heteronuclear spin system, I have a singlet and a triplet. So it's not like your usual high field singlets where it has to, you know, negligible chemical shift. In this case, there is no chemical shift. There's not even a difference in normal frequencies. So even for heteronuclear spin systems, you have a singlet and a triplet. Um, if you have uh, CH2, like in formaldehyde, then you end up having, um, you know, two doublets and a quartet. Uh, the one that ends up being actually observable happens at a difference of three halves times the J coupling. And if you have a CH3, you actually have an interesting case where you can either have those three identical protons add up to be a total of one half or three halves. And for the spin, for the total one half case, you get a peak at one times J. And when they add up to three halves, you get a peak at twice J. So you can directly see what's sort of going on in terms of these very, very basic uh, chemical groups. Things, of course, get more complicated rapidly. Um, we always like the case of benzene, which again, you can think of as having one strong heteronuclear coupling between a carbon-13 and a proton. Then you have the five other protons with a very particular symmetry. Um, it looks like a mess, but it exactly matches with simulations. And in fact, 
the precision is good enough that you can actually see the isotope effects as a result of having a carbon-13 instead of a carbon-12 changing the actual geometry of the molecule because it's changing these reduced, these, uh, these reduced masses and therefore the effective bond lengths. And really just the agreement is phenomenal. Um, you know, the, the, the full width of these peaks was uh, about 20 millihertz. That was not limited actually by T2 or T2 star. It was limited by my patients as a graduate student because this is actually Fourier limited with an 80 second acquisition. Um, I, I couldn't be bothered to measure for any larger than that. But you know, and really it's just the amount of information you can potentially get out of these sort of spectra is, you know, rather impressive. Again, when you're used to NMR, of course, there's a lot of information in general, but really the level of precision you can get it out at zero field where there's nothing else going on is quite nice. And you can go through and look at different molecules that have benzene, you have this carbon-13 a little bit further away, benzyl alcohol. Toluene is a nice case where, again, it's the CH3. So you can have those three protons add up to one half or three halves. Um, and if you take a look at the case where you have the, this 1J peak of toluene and the 1J peak of benzaldehyde, in that case, it's basically the same, you know, total spin one half for protons and spin one half for carbon coupled into this benzene ring. And so you can actually take a look at, you know, what these different spectra actually look like. And, you know, if you squint a little bit, they look vaguely familiar. And yeah, maybe there's some similarity there. You can see there's you know some peaks that are common. Yeah, you've got these three peaks down here, but everything doesn't quite match exactly. Um, so again, it's the match is not perfect, but the differences are fully understandable. Um, so you have some general shape that sort of looks phenyl ring like. But of course, we know that benzaldehyde and toluene have different levels of electronegativity for that functional group. Um, and in fact, there's also a different dihedral angle. Uh, we know, so toluene is a methyl, so that warmish temperatures, including room temperature, you have free rotation of that methyl. Uh, but if you actually have that aldehyde group, you end up being locked into the plane of that benzene ring. And so as a result, you can also see the differences in dihedral angles reflected in these spin-spin couplings. So we are also able to get some of the information that is really chemical information at zero field. It's not quite as straightforward, perhaps for the human brain as high field NMR is, but if you have a computer, addition of angular momenta is really no problem. So you can do it also quite well in that case. So I think maybe before I jump into the next area, if there's questions, I can also take a look at that. Great, yes. All right. Um, so a question from the audience. Uh, is the polarization of nuclear spins the same at zero field, irrespective of their gyromagnetic ratio? <laughs> Once again, my, my next slide is relevant. Um, but so, so actually something that is really, this, so this question is actually addressing something very interesting, which is that at high field, you are measuring individual spins. At zero field, you're not. Uh, that basically, you know, an individual spin operator is no longer a good quantum number. It's actually the combined spin that matters. So you're not looking at a proton flipping back and forth or a carbon flipping back and forth you're looking at the combined angular momenta of carbon and proton evolving. So really everything is mixed together maximally. So it's not even necessarily so meaningful to say that a given spin has a polarization. It's really more that the system is polarized into a given state. Great. Uh, how long does it take to acquire these spectra? Uh, depends how long you want to acquire for. So it's more of a T2 question. What about um, to get the, the kind of signal that you're showing on these on these plots? How long does that take? So uh, for these uh, benzene derivatives, um, this was I think this was over a hundred scans. So it you know 
took a couple hours. Um, however, if you look at simpler molecules, uh, single shot, um, and of course, if you have higher polarization, um, you can also do things again in single shot. Do paramagnetic uh, nuclei behave differently at zero field NMR? Paramagnetic relaxation is brutal at zero field. <laughs> is basically the, the short answer that I can give to that one. Um, yeah, I, basically the, the, the most paramagnetic relaxation that you are likely to have is at zero field. So we have not done anything or here we have not done much with paramagnetic materials. Um, paramagnetic impurities are definitely relevant um, and we very much see the effect of if, if we just take a normal NMR tube with a sample in it and measure it versus degassing it carefully. Even the presence of oxygen is a really huge deal. Question from uh, Owen Leskop, can you comment on the sensitivity and what was the concentration and volume for the benzene uh, <laughs> spectra in your example? Yeah, so the spectra that I'm showing are of neat isotopically labeled liquids. <laughs> so this is always a good question. Um, it is really hard to compete with inductive detection at high frequencies. Um, it's, and, and compared to, again, that's, and we are using, you know, within an order of magnitude, the most sensitive magnetic field detectors available. And even then, the sensitivity is limited. Um, and part of that is because we have not as much polarization. Um, some of that is actually, there's a couple of geometric effects, um, because traditionally, we always had to have this geometry and magnetic shields where we had to have optical access from two sides, from two different angles. So we're always measuring from below the sample instead of around the sample, as you do uh, with you know, more conventional uh, high field NMR saddle coils, for example. Um, so the sensitivity is not great for thermally polarized samples compared to high field. Um, again, we're, we're not trying to compete with high field. High field NMR has quite the uh, head start, so it would not be a very good choice for us. Um, it's, it's good enough to measure things, <laughs> is basically the answer that I have. Um, you know, with, if, when you have more and more sensitive detectors, you can bring down that noise, which means you can measure a smaller signal. Um, you, you can measure things in natural abundance, but in terms of actually seeing what the potential advantages for zero field NMR are, I'd say that it's actually more useful to take advantage of the fact that you need to have this header nucleus. So if you're looking, so if you're interested in looking at something that is that has a carbon 13 in it, uh, you can basically completely ignore things that do not have a carbon 13. So there is no solvent signal if you have a solution, provided that your solvent is not as stockly enriched. In terms of magnetic field sensitivity, it's uh, you know, we're able to get down to around five femtotesla per hertz. Uh, the commercial sensors are in somewhere in more of the 15 to 20 femtotesla per hertz. All right. We have a question from Jeffrey Bodenhausen. Uh, do simulated and experimental spectra readily converge? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if there's, a, if there's a, a, a bigger question about that from Jeffrey, but, uh, but yeah. Um, in the, in the best cases uh, where we have good sensitivity, uh, you know, we can get into that some sort of uh, sub millihertz agreement. All right. Uh, we have a question from Adam Gaunt. Does the presence of an OPM detector affect the field that the samples experience? Not that we are able to quantify at all. Uh, it's possible that there is some back action, but it seems to be extraordinarily weak. Um, and I, I'd actually, I'd, I'd be excited to be able to measure that effect because of course there are ways to cancel it out. Uh, but if we were able to see that effect, that would mean that we were 
really doing extraordinarily well. All right. We have a question from John. Uh, what about 2D NMR to help assigning peaks at zero field? Um, yes. <laughs> There's a paper on the archive, and I'll uh, if I can, if I manage to make it to the end of the talk, uh, there will be uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave the uh, the archive number up there. I mean, right. it's, it's more complicated because you have to figure out how to understand coherence transfer at zero field, which is different. But fortunately, uh, Tobias Yolander at Berkeley figured it out. So, All right, and we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, so you do not use something like inept at zero field? Uh, can you comment on techniques like that? There's no need. By default, uh, all spins are maximally coupled. So we're inherently in the strong coupling regime. So by default, we're not measuring N15 spectra. We're measuring proton N15 spectra. So effectively, we already are. Great. Well, we have a few more questions, but maybe we can save them. Uh, yeah, maybe we can the save them a little bit we... since I. <laughs> I've got, what, 10 minutes? That may be a stretch. We'll see what I can do. Oh, let's okay. proceed. So this question of nuclear spin polarization. So again, if you thought that high-field NMR had some sensitivity limitations, you, you should try measuring at zero field. So again, if we look at uh, you know, KBT divided by the Planck constant, so at around room temperature, we're looking at something like you know, frequencies of six terahertz. So we compare that to say 600 megahertz, we get into that sort of 10 to the minus four polarization range, um, which is not great, but not horrendous. Um, if you imagine trying to look at thermal spin polarization at zero field, where it's just based on the J couplings, and again, this is, you know, ignoring all the various, you know, factors of a few in these numbers. You imagine that you've got a, you know, just a J coupling and imagine that instead of it being a singlet and triplet, it's just a two level system. Then we'd be talking about something like a couple of times 10 to the minus 11 for our polarization. And understand how, okay, so obviously, you know, seven orders of magnitude is already pretty brutal. But to really drive home how brutal that is, if you imagine a sample of say, you know, 200 microliters of, you know, neat carbon-13 labeled acetonitrile, I guess uh, in one of those questions I forgot to answer that actually our samples are much smaller than normal NMR samples to measure from the bottom. So 50 microliters is actually usually enough. Um, <clears throat> but again, you talk about, it's about, you know, 200 microliters of acetonitrile, now we're talking about you know two and a half times 10 to the 21 carbon 13 spins. So if you look at the square root of that number, which is actually the the, um, in the transverse direction for nuclear spin projection, uh, if you look back at the, okay, the some of the original NMR papers, um, you know, for example, the one by Felix Block, um, even then they understood that just because of you know uncertainty in projection of these nuclear spins, basically you will have noise at the level of the square root of the number of spins. And so in fact, again, if you look at these, if you multiply that polarization times the number of spins, you will find out that basically at zero field, the thermal polarization is about the same order as the statistical fluctuations in nuclear spin magnetization. So more or less, we can say that at zero magnetic field, we basically have zero spin polarization. It's effectively useless if it's just at zero field. So we have to do something for some sort of hyper hyperpolarization. The trivial case is what I like to call pneumatic hyperpolarization, where we put it into a magnetic field, we bring it down to zero field, we apply a pulse or some other sudden change, and we measure what comes out. 
And so depending on how you like to define your enhancement factor, that means we get a rounded enhancement of uh, 10 to the six. Again, we're dividing by zero, so this is totally meaningless, but I sometimes just like to, you know, poke the DMP community occasionally. Um, again, if, if we have, you know, this adiabatic transfer, we end up with heteronuclear singlet order, um, which has a lot of uh, fun sort of applications in there. Um, because it has some things in common with your normal homonuclear singlet order. And in this case, everything is truly isotropic. So we decide what direction where signal comes by applying magnetic field poles. And actually, unlike a normal NMR where you end up with your spins polarized in one direction and then you apply a pulse and it rotates the spins, in this case, the pulse axis is the detection axis and no other axes if it's at zero field. And then the sudden transfer gives us a uh, magnetization that evolves just along that initial field axis because you're starting out projected along some axis and still whatever else is coming out is also gonna be projected along that. Alternatively, you can do something more clever. For example, you can use para-hydrogen. In this case, the only magnetic field you have to use is a small pulse, and yeah, this is on the order of Gauss. Um, so of course this has been done. Um, you know, there was a really nice paper uh, back in uh, 2011 uh, by Thomas Tice, where they saw that you can actually do para-hydrogen enhanced NMR at zero field. So this is really getting into this NMR without any magnets present. There's a picture of Thomas. Um, so again, I have limited time, so if you remember that if you take a look at hydrogen, the ground rotational state is also an anti-symmetric spin state. So you have this up, down, minus, down, up, which we call the singlet state. We call this para-hydrogen. Fortunately, because we have such a large gap between the rotational states and hydrogen, you can actually get para-enrichment just by cooling it down in the presence of rust. And as long as you no longer have that uh, catalyst, uh, really anything messy or paramagnetic, um, high-rated iron oxide works really well. Um, but you know, really any sort of dirt is going to work. Then it stays as para for a long time. Um, in terms of the the fundamental lifetime of the ortho to para conversion, it should be at least weeks, at least according to when. Wigner calculated it a long time ago. In practice, it's you know, easily days, as long as you have a nice clean cylinder for that uh, storage of bare hydrogen. And then in this case, it's the same sort of device, but now you, you know, bring a little tube to deliver para hydrogen and you know, some other gas handling stuff. Um, but now we end up getting you know, really just immense signals. In this case, this is uh, uh, dimethylacetylene dicarboxylate that is then uh, hydrogenated into dimethylmaleate. In this case, uh, you know, we're actually at the point where, you know, our, we're only a little bit away from our, our data acquisition card being saturated. And again, this is natural abundance and have a signal to noise that is, you know, large enough that you can't tell by looking. Um, it's easily a thousand. So we get another, you know, about 10,000 factor of enhancement. So again, comparing it back to what we had before with just that thermal prepolarization, now our enhancement is around 10 to the 10. Again, these numbers are meaningless because it's fun to show off. Um, the way this works is that you can think about just having para hydrogen. So triplet is not populated, but the singlet state is. Now we bring in a carbon 13 and we couple them in. So that singlet, just turns into a doublet, um, which ends up being mixed between these two doublets, actually. But again, and then that triplet ends up with a uh, quartet and a doublet. So again, it's a relatively easy energy level structure. Um, what ends up happening is that in practice, you have a higher population in one of these particular spin states. And if you look at you know, the differences between uh, the energies, you end up getting a spectrum that makes quite good sense. Um, so, you know, we see that as well. Um, 
the phase is opposite here because of how I made the picture. Um, but again, you see these two antiphase peaks at high frequency and then another one that's the same as the high frequency peak. Um, there's a bunch of additional stuff down here due to uh, other uh, carbon-13 locations. So if you have carbon-13 here, then you see these two. If you have it here, you see other stuff down here. Um, in practice, in some cases, you can actually see the case where you have a carbon-13 here, um, but we don't see it in this particular spectrum. You can also do SABR. Um, so your non-hydrogenative version with para-hydrogen. Um, so if you look at, uh, for example, pyridine, again, we did this one also, uh, you know, Thomas was leading this back at Berkeley. Um, you know, your enhancement is, again, on the order of uh, 10,000. And of course, you know, SABR keeps on getting more and more interesting, seeing more and more molecules, that's really exciting. And it's been actually really applicable at zero field. Um, especially some of the other work that Thomas has done, you know, he's done this SABR sheath work. Um, we have the nice advantage that we can measure inside of the sheath. So we can tune that magnetic field, you know, bubble air hydrogen at some field, then turn the field off and just watch the spins evolve. So we can directly see what's actually going on in terms of uh, nuclear spin polarization without having to worry about any of these other confounding factors of moving the tube into another detector. Um, yeah, and you can also do it for a long time. Uh, you know, we're interested in some of these fundamental physics experiments, so we would love to have just continuous saber. Um, you know, at the moment it still dies out after a few hours, um, but we're hoping to work on that. But it's also worth noting that you can start to see, even as you're doing it, changes in the solvent as certain materials are actually evaporating, changing the effective dielectric of the environment. So you actually see the changes in the J couplings reflecting that. Something that I definitely want to make sure that I mention while people are still able to listen is that there is also the option to just not polarize your spins. So you know, usually we're, we're used to thinking about large ensembles. So we're used to thinking that, okay, we need to measure a, a time averaged magnetization. That's all well and good for a large number of spins. Um, again, it's, it's not easy, but uh, DNP and various techniques are making that feasible more and more. If you get down to a small enough sensor, so you can bring it close enough to your spins, and remember that in general, you know, your magnetization, your magnetic field is going to die off as one on R cubed. You can actually measure far fewer spins. So much, much smaller samples become feasible. And in this regime, you have a different alternative. So rather than trying to measure the polarization of your spins, you can actually measure the fluctuations of your spins based on statistics. You know, and in some ways, you can think about this. If you go down to just a single nuclear spin, it is always polarized. It just becomes meaningless. But again, this makes sense because we're talking about the statistical polarization, which is going to vary as the square root of the number of spins. So square root of 1 is 1. If I have nine spins, then by default, you know, I've got a 33% polarization at any given time. And what's nice is actually that this noise is not white noise. This is correlated noise. So you can actually look at the, uh, at the power spectrum of this noise, and you can get chemical information now. So if you imagine that you have something like a nitrogen vacancy center in diamond, you know, this is basically a you know, single atom sized qubit um, that can also be used for detection. Now, if you have, you know, say a couple of spins on the surface near to that, they will still have this spin spin coupling. And as a result of that coupling existing, that will give a peak in the noise spectrum. So if you look at the, the, the basically your correlation between your noise, then do a Fourier transform on that, you will actually see that you end up again with a peak in your noise, in your, basically your noise power spectrum that corresponds to that actual chemical information. So I think this is potentially, and this is a really exciting thing, there's a lot of groups working uh, in these nitrogen vacancy centers, and I think the possibility of starting to get down to the sort of single molecule level is really, really exciting. 
Um, I don't know if we want to jump into any questions or if I should just try to get through uh, the few more slides. <laughs> Um, that's a that's a good point. I well, I'd just like to take a moment uh, while we're uh, coming up or just past the hour mark here to announce uh, next week's talk. Uh, next week um, we will have Professor Jan Hendrik, uh, who will be giving a tutorial about the clinical translation of dissolution DNP. So please tune in for that. Um, John, I think if you have time, we can keep going. Um, and certainly, uh, certainly we can save some questions until the end. How about that? Sounds good. Great. Okay. So as I had mentioned a little bit earlier, um, there are some real practical advantages for this zero and ultra low field NMR. One of them is that susceptibility ceases to matter. Um, in some ways this is, this is a strength and a weakness. Um, Again, you know, the chemical shift is really just a form of a local magnetic susceptibility. Um, the problem, though, is that if you have a bulk susceptibility mixing with that local atomic scale susceptibility, they will transform the same way, and it's really hard to separate them out. There are some possibilities, but really, in NMR, you need to have homogeneous samples. And if you have them mixed up, lines will get broader. However, susceptibility is you know, one of these multiplicative factors that is multiplied by the magnetic field. So if that field is zero, that effect of susceptibility is also zero. So there was this really nice work uh, by uh, Michael Taylor. Um, this is probably back when he was at Cambridge, but he's, he's now part of this uh, network um, and he's based in Barcelona. Um, and he saw that you know, if you look at you know, liquid just on its own, you have okay, 160 millihertz line width. If you now have it entirely absorbed onto beads, you get less than a factor of two increase in the line width. So really this difference in susceptibility just doesn't matter. And of course you can actually go through metal. As I was saying before, you can take your bell pepper, stick it into a Coke can for some reason and make these measurements. If you try to do this at Ifield, at best you get nothing, at worst you get a lot of uh, potentially destructive arcs and uh, other messy problems. Um, and so we've actually recently applied this to look at reaction monitoring in environments that you could not actually monitor with NMR before. Um, again, we, we took a, a simple hydrogenation reaction because we wanted some easy polarization. Um, so we started with this dimethyl acetylene dicarboxylate. Um, and there's a, you know, two different stages of hydrogenation. So you can have with the malleate and then succinate. And you can actually see them nicely in the spectra, well separated. And, you know, of course you can do this at high field just as well. But what's convenient is that you can measure under reaction conditions that would not actually work at high field. Um, yeah, and I should say, yeah, so this work was uh, done in collaboration with uh, our colleagues in Novosibirsk, um, you know, led by uh, Dudari and uh, James on our... So, of course, in reaction monitoring in high field NMR, you can do it. Um, you, have, you, know, you have a capillary going through from the reactor or whatever else you have, and you can then measure that even if it's flowing. Um, but what you can't do is you cannot measure in a heterogeneous environment. So we took a glass tube in a bench shop instrument and we you know, stuck a peak tube down through it and we bubbled bare hydrogen through it. And what you see is a big blob. Um, there's, maybe a, there's maybe a little bit of chemical information in there, but it's mostly just nothing. Um, if you stop the flow in between measurements, you still have this annoying piece of peak in there that messes up susceptibility a little bit. You can still get pretty decent resolution. At zero field, not only can we do it while continuously bubbling, we can do it inside of a metal container. So this is actually a high pressure uh, tube that we had designed 
just kind of for fun and to see how high of pressures we could actually work at with bare hydrogen. Um, for the first study, you know, we, our valves were limiting us, so we couldn't go much above 10 bar. Um, in principle, however, uh, we should be able to go up to 60 bar or so. Um, like at least 50 we're permitted to do, 60 has been tested to. Um, but so inside of a metal container, in this case it was titanium, so it was non-magnetic. But again, even inside of that, we have negligible reduction of signal and the line widths are still less than one hertz wide. So we have complete resolution, even though it's a heterogeneous mixture full of hydrogen bubbles, and it's inside of a metal can. And so even within that, we can still actually measure what's going on in terms of that reaction based on uh, the malleate versus succinate peaks popping up. This is something that, you know, unless you found, unless you decided that you wanted to, you know, actually bring your coils inside of the reactor, um, really could not be done with high flow that I'm on. And some of the real fun stuff, at least for me, in terms of what you can do at zero field, is that you can measure things that are really just never going to show up in a high field NMR spectrum. So if you look at all of the possible, you know, two spin coupling tensor or two spin one half coupling tensor symmetries. Um, you can see you can have you know your, your usual singlet or your scalar coupling, so that's basically just i dot s. Um, you know you, you may remember some parts uh, from your dipolar alphabet in terms of the rank two couplings. Um, you know you can also have these these rank one couplings that are really interesting. Um, you know, there's there's various nice colors with different phase wrapping in different places. Um, the thing is that. Uh, Almost all of these are invisible for high field NMR. Um, you know, of course, if you have a single crystal sample, you can you know, move the you can move it around to get different projections. Um, there are some ways to get some information back. There's the possibility of having uh, dipolar effects, um, uh, or just relaxation effects that can actually show up. They still won't show up as a splitting in your spectrum, um, but so these second order effects can drive relaxations. You can have indirect evidence of these things. But still, I'd like to point out that really all of the most colorful interactions in this picture are invisible for high field NMR. And sort of the, our, our favorite ones that, you know, starting at Berkeley, we were spending a lot of time thinking about were these, these rank one interactions, these anti-symmetric spin-spin couplings. Um, and part of that is because they're actually directly tied to chirality. Um, you can think about that as just the same way. You know, if you look at, you, know, you see these different, uh, the, the changes in colors, that means it's a change in the phase. Really what's, what's happening is that it's defining a surface. It's defining a sense of rotation. Um, and so again, these transform, you know, depending on situations as a vector or a pseudo vector. Um, but in fact, they actually transform it you know, in a very relevant way, the way that chirality does. And so it's in principle actually possible to have direct measurements of chirality in an MR. Because really what you're looking at is actually sort of the interference between the nuclear spin Hamiltonian and the molecular geometry. And now that I hang out with a bunch of fundamental physicists, this begs the question of, can we look at the possibility of violation of this mirror symmetry? The answer is yes, <laughs> we can indeed do that. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we, after a, really a tremendously long time, again, this is written, you know, partially with, uh, you know, collaborators and colleagues uh, from Berkeley, um, which means that some of this thinking started back when I was back there. Um, we uh, you know, finally got this paper out about showing that you can, in principle, actually look for the molecular, the molecular version of parity non-conservation based on spin-spin couplings in NMR. 
Um, this slide has equations on it, so I will try to avoid it as much as I possibly can. Um, but the important things to know are that the weak nuclear force does not conserve parity. In fact, it violates parity as much as it possibly can. Um, you can see this in nuclear decays. Uh, for example, the famous experiment by Madame Wu. And you can also see it in uh, in atomic spectra in specific cases. For more on that, you can uh, you can talk to Professor Goodger. But the real point is that we know that this effect is around, but we've never actually seen the effect on chemistry. There are some funny hints that people like to believe may be related. Um, you know, for example, the fact that we have this uh, biological homochirality that all we only use half of the possible amino acids. We don't use any of the right-handed ones. Um, and also, we don't use any of the left-handed sugars for the most part. I, you know, there's a couple of bacteria that do funny things, but for the vast majority in biology, we're only using a particular form of chirality, which is strange. People have and will continue to argue that this may be related to the weak nuclear force playing a role in chemistry. Much more likely, it's spontaneous symmetry breaking and templating, but that's another lecture. But still, the possibility of looking at nuclear physics having a role in chemistry is really interesting. And also feeding back the other way, chemicals are a much more tunable environment than what you can have in a lot of nuclear physics experiments. And so in principle, if you can actually use chemistry to study physics, it's a fantastic system you can actually have. Um, and the bottom line comes out to be that you expect to have for heavy diatomic molecules like uh, thallium fluoride, you know, something that's on the order of uh, millihertz. And if you're looking at lighter molecules like hydrogen fluorine, you're talking more about something that's on the order of microhertz. So small, but not so ridiculously small that you couldn't measure it. So the basic idea that is that you have your molecules, some sort of a sample. Again, you know, we used HF uh, as an example, despite the fact that HF is not really a diatomic molecule uh, in the liquid state, but we can pretend in the meantime. So what you can actually do is you can prepare an initial state along some axis. You can detect along another axis, and then you have an electric field along that third axis. Because again, we, we know that you can have rank two alignment in an electric field, because you know your molecule can be either with or against it, but it's unlikely to be transverse. But in the case of these rank one interactions, you actually need to have orientation. That means it has to be plus Z instead of just plus or minus Z. Um, and so the so again, if we imagine this just a two spin system, we start out if there's no electric field, no anything else, it's just a singlet and a triplet. If we apply an electric field and we get this alignment, uh, which you know still happens even in an electric field, you know the triplet plus and minus states go down in energy, the triplet zero goes up in energy. However, in principle, okay, and and of course on top of this, there's also the effect of this rank one spin spin coupling but it's tiny by comparison. However, if you actually have an oscillating field, then what ends up happening is that you begin, because this, as you may remember from uh, the couplings, you have this cosine squared theta dependence, whereas for a rank one term, you have a sine theta dependence. So if you have this cosine squared, you end up effectively with one minus cosine q omega. So the dipole-dipole part goes at twice the frequency, and if you tune things rightly, you can actually get this resonant effect to enhance uh, the driving influence of this rank one spin-spin coupling. So if we look about this in the picture, if we start out at just zero magnetic field and also zero electric field, we end up with, we start out with, say, 
ix minus sx, they beat back and forth at the J coupling frequency along that x axis with nothing along the y axis. Now, if you add a little bit of a, a DC electric field, so that you have this rank one coupling, now you'll have basically the same thing along that x axis, but the spins will try to go into the y axis. But as soon as the uh, J coupling reverses the magnetization, they'll come back the opposite way. So you get an extraordinarily small uh, oscillation along the other axis. However, if you have an AC modulation of that effect, you can actually have this resonant condition where you actually end up building up magnetization along that transverse axis. Um, then when you include this additional dipole-dipole coupling term, you get some further structure inside of that. But again, these numbers are actually in the realm of being very measurable. So again, this is, it's, it's you know, not quite one femtotesla signal, but if we have a 10 femtotesla per root hertz uh, magnetometer, and we can average for many, many seconds, there seems to be actually a very good chance that uh, zero field NMR could be used to be the actual first measurement of weak force effects in chemistry. Again, there's a lot of things, you know, I, I ran out of time a while ago already. There's even more things that I could tell you about. Um, I won't, I can get some, some of these questions, um, but for anybody who is interested in some of the other fun stuff that we've been doing, um, there are a couple of uh, links here to other papers that are currently out there. Um, there's some fun stuff going on in Lyon that uh, Roman in particular is working on. Um, especially just in terms of the uh, the orders of magnitude and fields that are present inside of that laboratory and also some uh, fun battery work that we've been working on. So I will briefly again thank all the people who were involved in this. Fortunately I talked about them before a little bit so I will leave this slide up um, in case anybody else wants to try to find some of those other resources and other than that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John, for a very interesting talk. Uh, very broad uh, talk. Um, and I think a great introduction. Um, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, Julia asks, how essential are simulations for reading chemical information out of zero field spectra? Is there any information that you can get directly from the spectrum? Well, for simple molecules, you can do it easily with pen and paper. Um, and again, it's, I, I would say that for probably most applications, if you want to just know what molecule you have, you really might as well just use high field NMR or mass spec or whatever else is available. Um, it's really for these sort of situations where you can't do it as well with high field NMR that it makes sense to work at zero field. So in a lot of those cases, you know, maybe you're looking at some, at order in a material, you know, looking directly at, you know, a liquid crystal molecule is gonna become very, very complicated because there's so many coupled spins. But if you look at some small molecular probe, you can understand what's going on pretty easily. And some, some level of, math tends to be necessary. Um, I'd say that it, it's never going to be uh, you know, as, as easy as the, the organic chemistry introductory NMR sort of spectra interpretation. But again, we have computers sitting around and they're actually quite powerful. So I'd say that for anything more than you know, five or six spins, you probably need to do it on a, on a computer. But I would argue that that's not such a bad thing. All right. We have a question from Michael Taylor. How does your titanium sample container impact the sensitivity of the magnetometer? It does not really seem to affect it at all. Um, it briefly screwed everything up horribly. Um, when, because 
for some reason, I thought to myself, oh, well, you know, okay, yes, the welding is going to be a problem, so it needs to be titanium on the bottom, but on the inside, we could have a stainless steel tube. The stainless steel tube basically pushed the magnetometers out of the operating range, and nothing worked at all. Um, so we cut off that stainless steel tube and replaced it with uh, just a really actually heinous and ugly yeah, mixture of uh, swage lock components to attach a peak tube that went down, and then there's no problem. All right. Um, what limits the sensitivity of your magnetometer? Uh, the signal and the noise. <laughs> um, so the, the signal is, as for all NMR experiments, relatively weak. Um, the particular arrangement that we've had in the past has really been kind of suboptimal in terms of geometry. Um, we've got designs to fix that soon. Um, so we're hoping to you know, get you know, maybe even an order of magnitude better uh, efficiency there. Um, and then there's uh, just you know, practical noise in terms of uh, lasers and so on. Um, in principle, you can actually get down you know, to the sort of you know, single femtotesla per root hertz or better. Um, in that case, you have issues of other magnetic noise coming in. Those are hard to deal with, but if, you know, there's ways, just hard work. Um, specifically, uh, depending on the material that your magnetic shield is made out of, if it's, a, if it's a conductive material, then thermal motion of the electrons in that metal actually give rise to magnetic fields, which in general are going to be relatively white noise and are therefore going to raise the overall noise level of your sensor. All right, we have a, a question slash comment um, from Daniela Barsky. Regarding simulating the spectra, uh, I would just add that positions of the peaks are readily predicted, but their widths may vary interestingly. There's a lot of room for more relaxation theories and ideas down there at the bottom of magnetic fields. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I agree with you totally, Daniela. <laughs> And it's in some ways it's actually a little bit surprising how frequently all of the peaks have exactly the same width um, in terms of intuition. I guess you would sort of expect that you know there would be some that would be narrower, some that would be broader, at least coming from the sort of high field thinking. Um, but in the case where it's a sort of simple case of everything being strongly coupled, actually everything tends to relax at the same rate together. Um, but as Danila knows as well as anybody else, um, well, yeah, also Michael, um, there's a lot of really interesting relaxation effects that happen at these low at these low fields and low frequencies. So yeah, there's a ton of interesting work going on on that. Uh, question from an anonymous attendee: What is the largest source of noise in a typical uh, setup? Uh, in particular for the Q-spin? So in the case of the Q-spin, so in terms of white noise, um, that's probably, and I would imagine that the Q-spins are limited by uh, photon shot noise. This is my guess, um, because again, they're using relatively small scale lasers, just these, uh, these Vixel lasers that are sort of on chip. Um, there's another kind of annoying flavor of magnetic noise <laughs> that comes into those um, because of the fact that uh, they actually work in a single beam configuration and then they have, and they then demodulate uh, uh, signals at 923 hertz, which means that high harmonics of line noise show up as peaks in otherwise funny locations. It took us a long time to figure out why there was random noise peaks at 127, 173, 227 hertz, 273 hertz. 
but then we figured out that they were demodulating at 923, so it kind of made sense. All right. Um, we have another question about quadrupolar nuclei. The question is, curious about quadrupolar nuclei, can you comment on them? Uh, you've talked a lot about spin one-half nuclei. Yeah. So in terms of our favorite kind of operating definition of what zero and ultra low field means, generally we, we say that we're defining at least the, in this case, so zero field is where it might as well be zero. So any Zeeman interaction is smaller than relaxation. Um, but so ultra low field, we like to refer to as the case where local spin interactions are stronger than interactions with external magnetic fields. So in that sense, I would say that a lot of the NQR that's done at zero or effectively zero magnetic field um, really falls under the umbrella of this Zulf NMR that I'm talking about. Um, so that, so in that sense, you know, all NQR that's not done in a huge magnetic field sort of qualifies. Um, however, there's also some interesting stuff uh, that comes in in terms of actual quadrupoles um, in the sort of J-coupling limit. Um, you know, for example, we've measured um, ammonium, which is a handy molecule because it's symmetric. So as a result, there's no electric field gradient that's going to cause this rapid relaxation. Um, and in other cases, there's actually some interesting effects in terms of uh, what's referred to as a scalar relaxation of the second kind, where if you have a quadrupolar spin that is strongly coupled to your other spin one half nuclei and is not relaxing fast enough to self decouple, you can actually end up with everything just relaxing together basically immediately. Um, so if you take, for example, again, our favorite molecules in cedar nitrile, find the number of papers you can write about a molecule as simple as a cedar nitrile when you work at zero field is really nice. But um, so if you have just the methyl carbon as carbon 13, there's no problem. You can see the spectra really easily. It's reasonably narrow. It's a little bit narrower if you had an N15 instead of an N14, but it's not a huge difference. However, as soon as you have that second carbon being carbon-13, it's the one that's directly bound to that nitrogen, if it's N14, you see nothing. Because in that case, you, are, you have brought the N14 into the strong coupling system and everything relaxes together. Um, actually, there's a great paper, a great paper by uh, Michael Taylor where he really went through and looked at this. Um, and what's nice is actually, it, it really seems like it's just N14 that's a huge problem. <laughs> Unfortunately, N14 is, has a tendency to show up places. Um, but it seems like deuterium has a small enough quadrupole moment that it's not going to be quite as crippling. And, uh, you know, for example, chlorine and bromine have such large quadrupole moments that they self-decouple really effectively. All right, uh, we have another question uh, um, from an anonymous attendee, kind of following up on that. Uh, and, and, and the question is, in high field, quadrupolar spins act often as polarization sinks due to quadrupolar coupling. In zero or ultra low field NMR, can this large fictitious field uh, induced by quadrupolar coupling act as a polarization source? Maybe. I, this thought has occurred to me. <laughs> Um, I think it could be a really interesting, and um, you know, sort of an analog, almost of the Overhauser DNP, is sort of the way that at least it vaguely shows up in my brain. But yeah, I I think in principle, yes. All right. Well, I guess I can point out that in that case, you would need to use probably circularly polarized mic uh, RF to drive the transitions uh, because of the symmetry at zero field. But again, that's 
really not hard. You just build a little bird cage coil. All right. Well, I think we've had a great discussion, uh, and we're well past the we're well past the time. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for sticking around and answering these questions and for giving a great talk um, and a great introduction. Thanks.